Simon. Great. Thanks very much. Um, can I start with Admiral Blair? Um, I read with great interest an article that you co-authored in the Vancouver Sun um, looking at Asian energy demand and, as well as the growing U.S. energy supply. And clearly these are both um, important uh, phenomena with global implications. I was wondering, how do you see the interplay of these two phenomena developing with um, the ability in the long term for the North American energy suppliers to help the Asian uh, consumers meet this, this demand? Um, in particular, this, this sentence I was interested in, um, as increasingly important potential natural gas suppliers to China and India, the US and Canada can influence both its efficient use and a greater commitment to energy sources that do not damage the global environment. So, of course, normally um, energy suppliers simply um, sell the energy. This is a somewhat different approach I think you're um, describing, whereby the, the suppliers would hope to, to influence the energy policy in the, uh, in the consuming countries. Could you expand on how you think that influence could be exerted? Very well. As... Uh as was pointed out this morning, there's, a, there's going to be somewhat of a time delay in this since the first American export plant is uh, only now under, under construction. But the basic, um, the basic uh, effect of substituting natural gas for coal in power generation is to move the uh, pollution carbon dioxide curve down by a factor of about 50 percent. It doesn't change the the fact, but it, it buys some it buys some time to uh, in in order to uh, work on alternative forms of energy, which do not uh, do not affect affect uh, global warming warming. And the, the other thing is, although that although gas is not a um, an international market in the way oil is, uh, nonetheless the um, uh, it, it wasn't more than a couple of years ago that the United States was building. Um, uh, liquid natural gas import facilities in great numbers on the on the on the Gulf Coast, and uh, large amounts of the world's natural gas were going to come into the United States to satisfy its demand. That's completely changed. The United States supplies all of its uh, all of its own needs from uh, from domestic uh, wells now, and that means gas from places like Qatar and uh, Australia is available to. Uh, go elsewhere, and of course, Asia, with its the premium price that we heard about this morning, is, is the place that um, the place that uh, uh, sucks sucks the most of that with its increasing demand. So I think that the I think that this North American uh, boom has has the capability simply to um, simply to make uh, gas a bigger part of um, a bigger part of the energy mix here in Asia. And you, you heard in the discussion this morning that uh, there. Lively discussions on a new hub here in Northeast Asia on better infrastructure. The, the other factor, of course, which doesn't concern America, is the uh, is the Russia-China gas deal, which is uh, bringing a whole other supply of uh, of gas to uh, to uh, this part of the world that that normally went to the to the West. So uh, we had a conference a couple of years ago that uh, used that phrase. I think from the IEA, is it the golden age of gas uh, and and uh, and I, I think that uh, that is the um, that is the dynamic that we're we're seeing here with with, with generally good results. Uh, the only the only downside potentially, of course, is to make people complacent about uh, about the environmental effects and simply say, well, gas is going to solve it. Uh, uh, gas can help postpone it, can improve the chances, but it, it's not going to solve the uh, the uh, increase of uh, global uh, greenhouse gases that we are seeing. Thank you. Um, Mr. Connor, um, Japan, of course, is the uh, world's number one importer of LNG, mm -hmm. and Korea is number two. And there have been some voices in particular in Japan saying that there should be more collaboration between Japanese and Korea and perhaps other Asian LNG importers to achieve better costs, to, to pool their negotiating power, mm -hmm. um, to collaborate on bargaining. There is, of course, a big price gap. Uh, between LNG prices in Asia and the rest of the world. In part, this is because of the big spike in, in consumption. You also have different um, pricing models whereby the, uh, the gas imported in Asia is mostly linked to oil prices rather than to the Henry Hub, uh, as would be the case in, 
in the U.S. So what scope do you think there should be for Asian um, LNG importers, in particular in Japan and South Korea, to achieve better pricing power and to eliminate this big price gap that has developed? Well, thank you. Uh, there's a big Asia premium on the gas in uh, this region, and uh, we need to cooperate not only with Korea, but probably with China and India as well. But before we go into international cooperation, domestically, the gas industry is separated from the power industry in Japan, and uh, their facility is not interchangeable. I think we need to connect the gas facility domestically so that gas company can utilize each other and the power, power industry and the gas industry could cooperate each other. That would uh, increase the uh, bargaining power of Japan. And then on top of that, if we could, uh, uh, if we could work with Korea and other country, uh, that would be good. Uh, right now, the Japan's foreign relations in East Asia is not so good. And uh, interdependence on uh, energy would get those countries closer and it would be better. So I think it's a, it's a very nice uh, card that uh, we could use and I think we need to increase that our uh, cooperation. One thing that we worry is, Anthony mentioned uh, in the last uh, session, that U.S. was supposed to be the huge importer of natural gas from the Middle East, you know, 10 years ago. But now by 2030, the U.S. will be the net exporter of the gas. So, and at the same time, because of their government deficit, they'll be cutting down the military expenditure. So we are worried that U.S. commitment to the Middle East will sort of go down if U.S. leave the Indian Ocean, who would dominate the water, as he said in the session. And that is our worry. So it is good to import the shell from the United States, but at the same time, it is uh, our major concern to get the U.S. keep committed to the Middle East. Thank you. And Mr. Jude, speaking of um, collaboration, um, I read um, recent reports from, from your organization, the, the ADB, um, that we're talking about the need for greater collaboration on energy. But so far, there has really been very little. I mean, the only multilateral intergovernmental um, initiative on energy is the collaborative mechanism. And the two biggest economies in this region, Japan and China, are not part of that. So obviously, it's its power is, is limited in that sense. What should be the, the first steps towards achieving really important um, improvements in collaboration on this? For LNG collaboration, I think as he clearly pointed out, you need to have the volume uh, and to have a regional hub. And to have that, you know, to, you really have to get all these countries working in concert. And that's not happening at the moment. Uh, you have Japan and Korea trying to source their own uh, LNG requirements, whether from the U.S. or outside. But they're not looking at only the U.S. as per se. Others are looking at Tanzania. The others are looking at uh, Qatar, looking at Australia. So you have different areas to hedge your supplies. So you're not putting all your eggs in one basket at the moment. What for us is what we are looking at, regional cooperation. We are looking at from a regional cooperation uh, from not only from gas, but also looking at also for power. The gas side, what we have regionally started is the TAPI, as you well know, as we recently signed the agreement, and ADB is now in charge of putting the deal together for the TAPI, from, which is actually uh, Turkmenistan getting into Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, the whole pipeline chain. And they want everything to be ready by 2017. Uh, we think that may not happen by 2017, it may be 2018 or maybe by 2020, there may be slippages. And that is, it takes time. You need to get the countries on board. You need to get them to agree. And that takes a lot of time. That concerns, like I see pointed out, in the Northeast, Japan, Korea, China, the relationship is not that strong at the moment. How do you get them to collaborate? Uh, and this country is a developed country. For ADB to play the interlocutor in a developing country is much more easier than in a developed country <laughs> to go and tell them what to do. They will tell you, look, ADB, you know, please get out. So that's a challenge. And it's 
Uh, Mr. Hughes, the, um, the recent deal between Gazprom and CMPC was seen as a very, um, as a very significant agreement with, with long-term implications. Um, at the moment, uh, the, as I mentioned, the, uh, the needs of, the, of this region for energy are largely serviced by the Middle East. Do you see with this arrangement uh, with Russia, um, between Russia and China, the potential for other countries to, to form deals with Russia, perhaps? Um, in the long term, we will have the US presumably exporting energy to this region, perhaps Canada exporting more energy. Um, do you think the, the prospects are quite bright for, for Asia to secure new sources of energy? Do you think um, they will benefit from perhaps competition between Russia and the US in the long term in supplying energy to this region? Um, or do you think there could be challenges in securing energy supplies? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting question. I mean, I, I personally see the, the China-Russia deal, uh, we were discussing this last night, as hugely significant, and I think it's all part and parcel of a very concerted, coherent, and long-term Chinese goal of putting in place the conditions for gas-on-gas -gas competition in order to drive down the, the, the cost of the energy that they are bound to, to import, and the Chinese know this full well. So it, it's been a key feature of their policy that they will do everything in their power to ensure that the increasing volumes of energy they do have to import will be at an affordable cost for the Chinese economy, and I think the prospects for, for, for them doing so are very good. And I think the, the deal with Russia is, 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 a, is a big piece in that, in that, in that Chinese jigsaw. Uh, if I can just pick up on a few points already made in terms of uh, the, the whole issue of, of gas, the golden age of gas. And it's interesting to note the, gold, the term the golden age of gas is not new. The, the IEA reproduced it in 2011 as, uh, as being, we, being on the, now on the verge of a golden age of gas. But the, the, the global gas industry has been on the verge of a global gas, uh, age of gas for actually two or three decades now. And it's never quite happened. It's never quite realized its potential. Each time something has happened, that means it hasn't realized that, that huge potential that gas must have because of its, its very attractive attributes. And why is that? A big issue has been pricing. A big issue has been market structure. And I think it's incumbent on both sides, the supply side and the demand side, to, to actually come together and work together to realize the potential for gas, which in terms of affordable, environmentally friendly energy must have a key role to play, but may, may disappoint. And the IEA has now downgraded its demand forecast for gas, for global gas demand growth, for the third year in a row. So gas already is, is the IEA is already drawing a little back from the golden age of gas forecast. A lot of that is down to Europe where gas has actually priced itself out of the power market. And, and there's a lesson, I think, for Asia, in that the conditions must be push, put in place, the dynamics must be put in place to allow gas to price into that growth market, where it doesn't have the field to itself. The, it has a big competitor called coal, with all, all the environmental sort of, uh, ramifications that that involves, and gas has to compete with coal, because you know, it, it, can't, it won't price at a premium into that market. It'll have to be affordable. And I think on the, on the demand side, I agree with what Konosan had to say. I would add one other measure, which is competition on the demand side. Because as long as you have monopoly buyers, monopoly buyers with, with a, basically a, an ability to pass through the cost to their customers do not have a huge incentive to negotiate hard with the supply side. And one of the great ironies in Europe uh, which is now dismantling oil indexation, which is now pushing down the imported price of gas, is this has come about largely as a function of com competition in the marketplace, which means buyers have a choice and are no longer sort of um, obliged to pay a monopoly pass-through price. So competition in the marketplace puts the onus on the big gas importers. And one of the big defenses of the, the monopoly incumbents for a long, long time was they needed volume to be able to nego mm. negotiate effectively with the likes of big suppliers like Gazprom. That's proven to be absolutely not the case. Because all the pressure for change has come from the market, from buyers demanding to be given choice and using choice to drive down their price of their cost of purchase, which then the suppliers, the wholesalers, the middlemen, have had to pass through to their, to their, their big suppliers such as Gazprom. Sorry, long no, answer. A point on this, uh, this business of who's going to keep the Middle East, uh, Middle East um, orderly. Uh, I've, we're going to talk about this in, in more detail this evening, but if you... If you look carefully at the sources of instability in, uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, they are primarily internal, not external. It prim primarily has to do with these uh, religious, tribal, sectarian um, uh, uh, fault lines within, within, the, within the countries. I, I think the United States has proved pretty conclusively over the last 14 years that the 
way to handle these problems is not to invade the country and take it over and, uh, and, try, and try to, and try to uh, re remake it. Um, I, I think that uh, I think that there is a uh, a different approach for those who are outside of the region to be able to help those countries in the region to uh, to uh, maintain the, the sort of internal security and progress that they need in order to in order to uh, interact with the world community economically. And I think it's going to require a much softer touch of diplomacy, economic assistance, capacity building, um, a certain amount of defense uh, reassurance. And uh, although the United States has a lot of, uh, has a lot of uh, capability in that regard, so too do many other uh, countries. So I, I think that, um, I think that the days of the United States uh, trying to round up uh, coalitions of military forces to go into the Middle East uh, are and I hope thankfully so, uh, behind us. But the days of uh, countries uh, in, the rest of the, in the rest of the world, whether they be European, the United States, or, or Asian, um, working in a fairly sophisticated way with countries in order to help them uh, adapt and, and contain these internal pressures by satisfying, frankly, more of what their people want uh, in order to... Uh, maintain a certain amount of civil order and thereby being able to export petroleum products to the rest of us and receive products in return are, are ahead of us. And I, I think that's a challenge for more countries than just the United States. Thank you. Um, Mr. Connor, you're, you've spoken extensively um, in the past on Japan's nuclear industry, um, which of course became uh, entered the global spotlight after the a terrible Fukushima disaster. Um, at the moment, the government and the Japanese power companies are seeking to get the nuclear plants back online. It seems there are going to be some delays there, but they're still trying to make it happen. What's your view on this? On the one hand, there are safety concerns about uh, nuclear energy. On the other hand, there are people who say that for, for cost reasons, for carbon emissions reasons, for <coughs> general concerns about diversity of supply, it should be a part of Japan's energy mix and of Asia and the world's energy mix. What is your long-term view on this question? Well, I th we set up a nuclear regulatory agency independently. And uh, if they okay, I think uh, we should restart uh, several nuclear reactors, probably not before the summer, but probably sometime in this fall. I think it is necessary to uh, give us some kind of choices. But uh, the government uh, kicked out uh, two commissioners of this NR NRA uh, last month, and uh, re they, they, they changed the... Uh, they replaces uh, current commissioner with somebody who has been considered as a, considered as an insider of the nuclear industry. I think that was a real bad move. We are we are sort of uh, damaging the credibility of the safety agency, and in that that's going to hurt in the long term. And the government is really trying to speed up, and people can actually see the government and the business community is trying to put the pressure on the NRA to speed up the restart. And that is also damaging to the long-term credibility. We need to explain people that in order for the energy security or cost or climate change, it would be better for Japan to have several nuclear reactors running in the short term at least. And then we could take step forward. But our government is just try to jump onto the conclusion and supplying the wrong numbers to the people. So people are now saying the government is telling them lies again. And that doesn't help. That's what exactly happened before the Fukushima. And people now found out. So I think we really need to sit down and talk to the people and uh, give all the exact numbers, correct numbers, and we have to have a good argument with the people, and we need to convince at least the majority of people in short term it is 
something we need to do. And uh, I think, you know, when you talk about uh, cleaner energy in Japan, it's cleaner, meaning not corrupt. The power industry has been the most corrupt industry in Japan, and it had a very strong influence on the politicians and the bureaucrats, and they got to stop that. So the Abe government is trying to uh, sort of deregulate the power industry so that we, w we could bring in the market mechanism. There will be a lot of competition in the power industry that would lower the price down and that would give more choice to the people. And I think we, we need to get rid of the corruption in the industry. So that has to be done. Plus, we need to talk about how we're going to deal with the spent fuel. The spent fuel pool is going to be filled up. Like one power plant that they are going to restart, their spent fuel pool will only last for three years, and they would have to shut down after that. So we really need to talk about a dry, you know, putting spent fuel in dry cask and put the dry cask in the power plant. But the power company and the government has been telling the local people the spent fuel will not stay. It will go to a reprocessing plant in Aomori Prefecture. But uh, we don't need to reprocess because we're not going to get the fast breeder reactor. So we need to change whole strategy. And uh, I think we need to start telling people how we're going to deal with the spent fuel in the long term. And that has to be the start of the nuclear, new nuclear policy, I guess. Thank you. And Mr. Jude, another thing that the ADB has, has talked about is the desire for this to be the Asian century in terms of um, Asian countries growing quickly developing, achieving their economic potential. Um, but this region is not really rich in energy resources. Um, do you have any concerns that this could get in the way of, of the Asian century in terms of um, the, the costs of energy or the reliable supply of energy or the environmental impact of, um, of fossil fuel burning? The Asian countries are already feeling the impact. I mean, energy security is already an issue. Climate change is an issue for them. And environmental impacts are already being seen in a number of the countries. So what we have been trying to talk to them and also promote is clean energy. ADB does about $2.3 billion a year. We have a target of $2 billion. We have hitched, hit about $2.35 a year the last three years in clean energy. And when, for us, clean energy means renewable energy and energy efficiency, trying to promote that as much as possible. Energy efficiency can help defer investments if they actually implement some of these projects. Source, telling them to use cleaner, if they are going to use coal, coal, we realize coal is going to be here for some time, but we are telling them, go up the technology level, use super or ultra super critical. We will provide financing for those projects. But if you're using subcritical, then it will we'll not be possible by ADB to support those kind of subcritical projects. Only on a very rare case, and if the grid is very small and, and the country really needs a poor, uh, is very energy deficient, you know, if you take a very poor country. But in most countries, they can make that switch, and that's the, what we're trying to encourage them. And where possible, we tell them, use gas. And, and some of them, we have helped promote gas. Uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, we have done power projects for all of them. Even in Vietnam, we've done combined cycle projects, pushing up the technology. So technology is the issue. What they have to also address at the same time is the pricing issue in a number of the countries. While you take this uh, high-cost technologies at the, at the same time and higher energy price of gas, right, they need to remove subsidies, at least free and move to the market prices. Otherwise, it's going to have a problem. Uh, and this is something we have had several dialogues with different countries, and we are at different stages. For example, we have seen Uzbekistan, when we had this dialogue, Uzbekistan is a gas exporting country. But when we started talking to them about solar, they've developed a solar program for 7,000 megawatts for export, and we helped them build the first plant last year, a 100 megawatt grid plant, and they want more plants. And I think the Korean girl, the president was just there last week, I think having dialogue with the Uzbekistan government on seeing how they can promote greater solar energy. So some countries are taking those steps. Some countries have got policies, uh, but it's not being fully implemented on a ad hoc basis. To ask on the subsidies, um, it seems obvious and 
well established by evidence that subsidies are not a very efficient Correct. way of helping the poor. Yeah. Um, because uh, fuel tends to be used more by people who run cars, yes. by businesses. So, yeah. um, why why have governments like India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, Indonesia um, maintained these subsidies? <laughs> Well, they took it at a certain point in time when the governments could afford the subsidies, you know, and now they cannot. Today they cannot. Indonesia spends about $30 billion a year on subsidies. The energy sector alone is around 18 to $19 billion a year. Of course, they consider it as transparency because it goes through the parliament. The parliament approves this subsidies for the power sector, for the gas, and also for the petroleum sector. It's approved by the parliament. Similarly, in Malaysia, when they were selling gas, they were selling uh, natural gas for domestic market at $1 per MMBTU, just $1. And they've increased the price, even that price is lower than the Henry Hub price today in Malaysia. But the utilities are crying. They say the gas price has gone up, it's very expensive. No, they have to bite the bullet and start moving up. So that's what, they've, what the government is doing in some countries. They feel that they cannot continue this. India is also seeing that, but India is a bit sensitive. So they're trying to do now the reorganization of all the distributing utilities. And the Modi government just came out and told us they want help with the distributing utilities because they want to remove the subsidies, revamp the reorganization, and try to get the pricing right in the door. So unless governments take this kind of measures, it's not going to happen overnight, but they have to realize this. A few years ago in Vietnam, you can't talk to Vietnam because they say my generation cost is only five cents and that's it. So any private sector who wants to uh, generate power and their cost of generation can be six or six and a half, they will refuse. They say either you give me at five dollars or get lost. But that's how the Vietnam is. But now they're realizing they cannot. They have to increase prices. And domestic prices have gone up. I think now they're close to seven US cents. But it's still not that they still have to move it up to eight and a half to nine cents according to their own internal plans that the tariff has to go up. So a number of countries are realizing this, that they cannot keep the pricing down. They have been doing that because they want to sustain economic growth. Strong growth, six, seven percent, eight percent, by keeping prices as low as possible. And that has been a problem now. Uh, Mr. Hughes, the, over the past... Ten years especially, um, governments have talked a lot about green energy and the need to reduce carbon emissions. How much impact do you think this is actually happening, uh, this is actually having on energy plans for the future and on the energy markets? So, for example, recently President Obama of the US has outlined a new plan to reduce carbon emissions. Um, Prime Minister Abbott in Australia um, has effectively taken a move in the opposite direction. Um, so how do you think over the, um, already at the moment and in the future, energy markets are being and will be affected by the efforts to achieve greater energy efficiency? Interesting. I mean, at the moment, I think it's a bit of a damp squib, and we just had an interesting discussion on the panel, on the panel uh, in the preceding session about carbon pricing. And carbon pricing... Uh, it's just not happening. I mean, there's no interest in it. I think um, Anthony described it as, uh, as being a lack of appetite for this issue in, in, in Asia Pacific, in particular. Having said that, there are signs that it's coming back in, into focus now. And I think recent initiatives in, in North America, in the U.S. in particular, President Obama's initiatives around emissions are, are indicative. And, and there appear to be uh, there appears to be a concerted uh, dialogue going on with China in this respect leading up to Paris next year. Uh, I mean, I, I start to be relatively hopeful that the, a bit of momentum is starting to build again due to the, the recognition that this, this really is a, a huge issue that's not going to go away. It's still out there and it's getting worse by the year and therefore has to be addressed uh, you know, sooner rather than later. But at the moment, in terms of energy, energy pricing in Asia, it, it's, it's, a, it's a non-event, except in China, except in China where, again, there is movement on this front, and I think the recent American initiative uh, by President Obama's administration, I think, derives from, from a, you know, a dialogue with China, which, along the lines that the uh, U.S. won't be out there on its own, that, that there will be a sort of degree of support in the international community from the other major player, uh, which is China. And would you expect this to feed through into, for example, less use of coal, more use of gas, less use of oil, um, with real ramifications for the prices of those commodities? Well... Then we come back to the issue of affordability, and I think this plays right back into the issue of gas and gas pricing and the, the requirement of the onus on the supply side to price gas into market. Gas should be a winner, 
in this sort of this sort of this sort of context, it should be a winner. But in Europe, gas demand is now, has now declined for three years in a row because gas is not penetrating the, uh, the power market. The utilities are all mothballing their gas-fired capacity left, right, and center because of the pricing issue. So there's a challenge for gas here to realize its potential to the benefit of all, to the benefit of the environmental agenda by pricing gas into market. And so that, that for me, is a huge issue for the next one, two, three, four years. Thank you. If I could just finish with a question to Admiral Blair. Um, I think... Everyone agrees that um, Asian people and Asian uh, countries economically would benefit from greater collaboration on energy in terms of uh, exploiting resources and in terms of importing resources from elsewhere. This is also a time of very bad uh, diplomatic relations in much of Asia between China and Japan, between South Korea and Japan, between China and Vietnam, to give just a few examples. Um, how far do you think this will just nip in the bud any attempts to collaborate on energy, or, or, or do you think there are ways for governments, nonetheless, to push ahead? Yeah, th this issue of uh, linkage is uh, is a tricky one. What what's linked to what? What what is slowed down when relations are bad in a certain area? Um, based on what, what I see, the uh, the current um, the, the current uh, diplomatic tensions over South China Sea, East China Sea, um, uh, that involve China. Uh, the, uh, the uh, issues between Korea and uh, and uh, Japan over historical uh, incidents uh, seem to be effectively putting a stopper on new initiatives, especially new big initiatives. They don't seem to me to be actually reversing um, cooperation that is already in effect, well established um, well established mechanisms that are uh, uh, seem to be. Uh, seem to be survi surviving it uh, and all. But at a time when we need, and we've discussed in this panel this morning, several new initiatives that are required in the energy area in order to uh, both uh, benefit uh, prosperity and to, uh, and, and to protect the environment, uh, it's, it's very hard for a government to, uh, to on the one hand, uh, you know, be in a big diplomatic row with another country and then say, but over here, let's talk about this wonderful new <laughs> cooperative mechanism that just, it just chills those sorts of things. So I think it's a bad thing for, um, for uh, co uh, cooperation in the, in the energy sphere. And in fact, that goes for a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of other spheres. Um, what are the prospects? Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm sort of cautiously optimistic that uh, China and Japan are can can work out a, a truce over the Senkaku Daiwus and 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 Sino-Japanese cooperation can perhaps uh, resume uh, in the South China Sea. It really depends on on China. Are they going to pursue these aggressive uh, policies or or not? And I, and I think within between Japan and Korea, uh, I think there are lots of uh, lots of uh, Koreans and Japanese, uh, whom I know, who uh, would like to uh, solve these historical issues. Uh, the two countries came very close two years ago, and, and so I'm sort of hopeful that they can, uh, that they can, uh, over the next year or so, um, uh, reach a uh, reach an understanding on those that will allow them to go forward. But it's, it's slowing things down right now. There's no question. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists.